Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! With us tonight, the Conservative MP Jacob Rees-Mogg, Shamish Akrabati, a member of Jeremy Corbyn's top team as Shadow Attorney General, the SNP's former First Minister for Scotland who led the campaign for Scottish independence in 2014, Alex Salmon, the political editor of the Sunday Express, Camilla Tomini, and the feminist academic and author, Germaine Greer. Thanks, thanks very much. And remember, as always, you can join the argument from home using our hashtag BBCQT on Twitter, on Facebook. Text on 83981. You can push the red button and see what others are saying. Our first question comes from Lisa Wheeler tonight, please. Lisa. Um, following Jared O'Mara's rightful suspension by the Labour Party, is a public figure allowed a pass? Is a public figure allowed a pass? Um, Jared O'Mara, of course, who was suspended just the day before yesterday or yesterday. Um, Jermaine Greer. Well, it's not just a past, I think, in his case. It's creeping up on him all the time. But um, the assumption seems to be that he was dreadful when he was younger and he's getting all right now. In my experience, it's generally the other way around. <laughs> the younger are nicer than the embittered eld like me, uh, whose tongues get sharper and sharper. I never get my joke at the airport, and they say, have you got anything sharp in your luggage? And I say, just my tongue. <laughs> they never laugh. Oh. <laughs> it's really irritating. Um, <clears throat> I, there's, I'm confused about Jared O'Mara altogether. Um, I'd like to know a bit more about who else was in the running for, to stand as the candidate in that seat. It seems to me a kind of kamikaze operation. Um, and I guess I hope he can talk his way out of this. What's standing against Nick Clegg was kamikaze. I used to vote Lib Dem in the days when I voted, or yes. when there was a Lib Dem to vote yes. for. Uh, <laughs> so don't be mean about Nick Clegg. He's a perfectly no, decent human being. but it was he standing against. When yes, he said I, it... yes, I know, but I want to know who the other people were oh, I see. who could have been nominated for oh, that right. seat. I mean, it's not as if it hasn't got a pretty decent Labour history. Oh, so I thought you said it was a kamikaze. Uh, um, on uh, the uh, part of the party. No? Uh, 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 what, to put him in? Well, uh, uh, we'll, we'll hear about this. Would you think Shamini he'd last, judging from the way he's handled this little contretemps? I have no idea. Camilla Tumney. <laughs> Me either. Well, <laughs> apparently the party didn't interview him for selection, and equally there was some initial backtracking. Jeremy Corbyn supported his continued membership on the Women and Equalities Committee, which seemed absolutely nonsensical. These weren't just remarks that were misogynistic, also remarks that were homophobic. He's justified them um, in part by saying they happened a long time ago and his supporters have said, look, he was a young man. He was in his 20s, he wasn't a teenager. Equally, some of the remarks that have been reported and the uh, blog Guido Fawkes has led the way with this expose, um, it's been suggested, and again, it's subject to investigation, that he made some very disparaging remarks towards somebody in a nightclub just eight months ago. Um, so, no, I don't think it is appropriate for him to remain in the party. He's been suspended pending this investigation. Um, but it does cast a new light on the influence of people like this in the Labour Party, the notion that there are some nasty elements that need to be rooted out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Shakrabati. So, Jared O'Mara has clearly done some very bad things. He's made some appalling remarks, and there's no running away from that. Um, but in relation to the question, yes, public figures should be allowed to have a past. But the question is, has this public figure changed? Now, my understanding of the situation is that initial revelations were historic. They, go, they went back 15-odd years, and he apologised fulsomely to the entire parliamentary Labour Party in person and on that basis on that basis his apology was accepted and you know he was given a second chance chance then new revelations which are more recent and potentially more serious and so then rightly 
um, he has been suspended pending an investigation. And just one final point, Camilla, there was no backtracking. I know it's been reported uh, that Jeremy Corbyn said he shouldn't resign from the Women's um, and Equality Committee. That's, that's not true. And, of course, he did, he did some, quite some rightly resign from that. Uh, shall we just yeah. clarify one thing? Yeah. How long was it <clears throat> between the moment when you found out about the latest allegations and the moment when he was I believe that, that was very, I, I believe that that was very that was very fast it's just that it's one thing to say I was a troubled young man it was 15 years ago I'm very very sorry it was a long time ago. that's that that's fine but have you really changed and, and of course the, the you know the, the subsequent revelations and allegations are more recent so is he, and is that's he now, why he's suspended is and he now out of the party for good no he's under investigation but, in I mean, relation can he to work his way back or not well, or is it? there's got to be due process i mean mm. I, I believe in being firm but i also think we have to be fair he's I mean, as out of the party as ken livingston is at the moment which is suspended but not no, no 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 that's not true i'm sorry but i am the shadow attorney and that's not the same because um this it, jared omara is currently under investigation and therefore these you know these charges have to be investigated. He's got to be looked at fairly. All right. OK. Um, that's what we should do. You in the front, sir. Yes, I think the problem is with the rise of momentum, we're going to get a lot more of this. Um, I think the Labour Party, as we know it, is, should be frightened because the next election, these people are going to be put into, dropped into uh, seats without any selection. Um, and... It could be the end of democracy as we know it. Well, you're I saying he got think. in without due process. And he wasn't checked. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and the woman there on the, on the gangway, yes. I was just going to say that actually the point of the question wasn't about um, selection, etc., although that obviously is a point. It wasn't about momentum and the Labour Party generally. It was a more general question mm. about whether or not people in the public figures um, and the um, public face of society, politicians yeah. of all walks of life, would be entitled to a past. It's not a singling out of the Labour Party. No, fair yeah. enough. What's your view? Because you asked the question. Um, my view, um, I, I agree with what Shami says, that actually he has a number of things that he's done in the past, and actually I think that we've all done things in our past that we probably regret, um, unless I'm on my own, which I doubt it. Um, but the question is, some of the things he's done recently are, or the allegations exactly. that have been made recently, and I think I should be clear about that, mm. are actually... Um, quite worrying and I think okay. that that's the thing that needs to be dealt with. Uh, Alex Salmond. Well I agree with the questioner absolutely. Uh, one of the, uh, probably the only thing that George Bush Jr memorably ever said sensibly was when he was asked about I think alcoholism and drugs he said <clears throat> when I was young and foolish I was young and foolish uh, and that was a good reply and, and if this had just been Mr Amara's past uh, as I mean, 21 or whatever mm. on the online then I, I don't think we'd be well. I don't think we'd be having it as a question uh, tonight. Uh, the more worrying things are twofold. Uh, one that uh, the tweets and texts are pretty nasty stuff. I mean, they're misogynist, they're anti-gay, they're homophobic, uh, and they're not in the past. It's the present which is catching up with Mr. O'Mara. Mm. Uh, another aspect is, of course, uh, what the gentleman raised uh, uh, about: was he ever vetted? And because the, the suggestion seems that he didn't actually go before a vetting panel, perhaps because that wasn't a seat that Labour expected to win when they were selecting the candidates in a surprise election. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it's the sort of thing you would expect a normal vetting panel to, mm. to uncover. Where I disagree with the, the gentleman, if I can, is I, I don't think this is about the Labour Party or momentum or any party. You know, one of the most depressing things about this sort of stuff is the, what I call the whataboutery. Mm. You know, somebody says something wrong in one party, and I say, ah, but what about so-and-so who said such and such, and this one said that, and, I mean, sexism is pretty endemic in uh, society, and we should recognise that. And once we recognise that and recognise it's not a particular problem for a particular group and a particular party, then I think it might help the debate. Okay. But I do agree that Mr Amara has the right to defend himself. <coughs> he has the right to go in front of the party inquiry. You know, it shouldn't be lynched by a combination Guido of Guido Fox, <laughs> the Daily Mail, the Sunday Express, the Daily Express. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, just think about it for a second. All the right. Sun Alex. is lecturing people on sexism. Had been, this is a substantial Had he, okay. been, Alex, had he been a Tory much. MP, he would have been lynched by The Guardian, The Independent, yeah. Northern right. right. Not by me. All right, Jacob. Jacob rees well, well, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Before, I think Mr. Amara is entitled to due process. 
I think that politicians are allowed to have done things in their youth that they wouldn't wish to repeat now. But there must be limits, that there must be some things that we feel are so beyond the pale and so indicative of a political belief that they become inexcusable. And I would go further. I think we should be really worried as a society with online abuse. Mm. And this is a particular problem for female MPs. Mm. They get a level of abuse that as a male MP, I don't get. And I'm not entirely free from controversy from time to time. <laughs> but I simply do not get it. But people like Jess Phillips, who is a friend of mine, is appallingly treated. She gets death threats. She gets hate words addressed at her on Twitter. And so I think somebody who is involved with that is doing something that is very corrosive to society. And society needs to look at itself and think, how are we putting up with this? And how are we going to stop it? Because if we don't stop it, it will deter very good people from taking up high-profile roles. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll go on. I'll take our second question, Zahid Khan, please. Zahid Khan. As Raqqa is recaptured and freed from ISIS, people who travel from UK to fight for ISIS will be looking to return. Should they be allowed back? All right, well, um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, you start on this because it was a member of your party who made remarks about this that were it was widely indeed. reported. It, it, it was Rory Stewart who made remarks about this. Um, Again, I think people are entitled to due process. I believe that one of the fundamental freedoms that we have as Britons is that we have a rule of law and that we are innocent until proved guilty. And that should always apply. I think it's wrong to uh, uh, say that people are guilty before you've got evidence. Rory Stewart but said, let me just quote him, um, uh, that... Uh uh, IS fighters are a serious danger to us. Unfortunately, the only way of dealing with them will be, in almost every case, to kill them. Look, I, uh, I, I'm not in favour of capital punishment, and I'm certainly not in favour of the state taking life without due process. That, um, it, if you are at war, people get killed, but we are not going to be fighting with these people on a battlefield to take them out using special services, I think would be illegal mm -hmm. under UK and international law. But we must make sure that they are properly vetted when they get back. We must make sure that they have committed, if they have committed crimes, that they are given very long sentences. And if necessary, we must hold them until we've had a chance to investigate, which I would not normally be in favour of. But I think you can make a reasonable guess that if you've gone out uh, to fight for ISIS, you are a fairly undesirable person. You mean hold and them indefinitely? Not without indefinitely. Without. Hold them for a limited time to try and gather evidence so that you can then bring them to trial. Mm. I think it is a reasonable assumption that most people who have gone out there are likely to have committed crimes whilst they're out there. But a reasonable assumption should not deprive somebody of their liberty forever. Okay. You, sir. Don't hold them anywhere. Don't hold them back in. Don't hold them back in. And you? You, sir, in front here? The moment they get on that plane to go wherever they want to go, um, that's it, they lose all rights as a British citizen. <laughs> if, they're, if, they're gonna, if, if, they're, if they're going to kill, uh, potentially, um, British soldiers, um, then no, they... they they've don't. lost their rights. They've lost it. Why, why should they? Jermaine Greer, there's two people saying they've lost their rights, don't let them back. Uh, which doesn't mean that we can simply murder them. Uh, because illegal killing of people is what's known as murder. But we don't know that they did murder us. What we know is that they went to fight for ISIS. We don't know why they went to fight for ISIS, but we seem to believe that if you go to fight for ISIS, the outcome is that you will be loyal to ISIS. This isn't actually the evidence that we have had, that the situation when they get there is phantasmagoric. It's dreadful. And we need to debrief them. We need to know what's going on. They have to talk to us. Shamish Akrabati. Well, this is um, slightly strange for me, perhaps, because we're now about, I don't know, 10 minutes into question time. We're on to the second question, and once more I'm going to completely agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. I'm not at all worried, but, it, but that's, that's... It's that's, no, it's no but indictment. No, but, he's complete, but, but on this, Jacob is completely right. We believe in the rule of law. 
we believe in fundamental rights and freedoms and we do not take people out rather than arrest them and put them on trial. Now, so as what, to, as what to this, Rory Stewart no, as to the said, sorry, just to uh, yeah. go back to Rory Stewart, yeah. what he said you take issue with. Well, what, you know, I, I don't know what exactly he meant and I, and I don't want to have a go at Rory Stewart, but the point is you can sometimes use lethal force. As Jacob said, you can use it on the battlefield. Mm. You can even do it on the street of your... Of your town in the UK if it is strictly necessary to save life. That is lawful under English criminal law and under international law. But we are not ISIS. We believe in the rule of law. And you know what else? Even from a sort of practical um, national security and world security point of view, Jermaine's point is very important. We need intelligence. We want to know why these people went in the first place. We want to know what intelligence they bring back about other people who are, who are at liberty in the UK. So there are all sorts what, what, of reasons why you can't the, just look the other way and pretend no, that it's good riddance to bad rubbish. No, but what, it, it, what about it the idea like of... <laughs> we'll go back to you, sir. The, the man up there at the back who said that they should just simply not be allowed back it's into not, the UK. Well, it's not very odd why they went, is it? It's they not went what? For, they went for one reason. Well, they all... went to Syria for one reason, to murder infidels and, yeah, you know, but... the, the local population. There are, people, there are people who may have been brainwashed, there are people who may have gone as, as, ro as mo romantic ISIS brides who then very quickly changed that. There are all sorts of things at play here, but the point is, the world is shrinking and it's interconnected. You know, people are a danger to us over there as well as over here, and we cannot, we cannot turn our back right. on our responsibilities isn't one of the law. I was going to say, isn't one of the problems and why there's public frustration that's been echoed here um, is that some of the existing laws just don't seem to be successful in bringing these people to justice. So temporary exclusion orders, for instance, I think only one's been used. Equally, there are arguments that counteract the efforts that are being made to bring these people to task. There was a suggestion in a Times leader um, earlier in the week that we should reinvigorate the law of treason and we should make example of these people and say, look, you have committed a crime against everything that Britain stands for, Britishness itself. Um, I don't agree with um, an eye for an eye. I equally found Rory Stewart's comments uncomfortable because drone strikes usually involve some collateral damage. We look at the recent killing of uh, the so-called white widow, Sally Jones. We still don't know what's happened to her 12-year-old son. Right. Unfortunately, he may well have been killed with her. I'm sorry, but a 12-year-old doesn't choose to be in that situation. Mm. Of course, his mother was culpable, <coughs> but, but, but I'm not but, comfortable with the collateral damage that could be children's deaths. What Mr Khan was saying was, should they be allowed back into the UK? That was your question, wasn't if it? If they're allowed back, fine, but let's actually no, try no, them No, no, should they be allowed back is the question. They should be allowed back. Under they arrest, should, potentially. They, they should be facing due process, but what the government needs to sort out is, under what basis? Right. What are they being tried for? OK, you, sir. They've aligned themselves with a, 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 a force that is against the West. It, it, it's, it's declared war on the West. We are the West. They've aligned themselves with that force. And, and I agree with you. Like, I agree with what you said, that um, the, the laws around treachery need to be rebooted. You know, mm. Tony Blair took those away. They need to be tried as traitors. Uh, but, but a, a, a treason law which would mean that whatever their reasons, if they'd been shown to have joined ISIS, they would be in prison. Is that Absolutely, what you're yeah. They would. Uh, Alex Salmond. Yeah, but it's not, if I could say to the gentleman, quite as simple as that. One, one of the great mistakes, I think, of many, many mistakes that has been made in our Middle East policy is we're not giving sufficient support to the Kurds, uh, who have been by far the most reliable allies, who have the, the best track record of having a, uh, where they control having a society which allows people of all religions to coexist uh, peacefully. Uh, now, a Kurdish fighter, those volunteers have gone to fight for the Kurds. Some of them have been on television over the last week. These people already, and almost certainly over the next few months, will be in conflict with the UK-backed uh, Iraqi government. Mm. Because it's almost certain there's going to be armed conflict escalated between the Iraqi government and the Kurds. If one of the UK volunteers has gone to fight for the Kurds against ISIS, is then drawn into that conflict, would he then... No, be in the he, same... He's not going to come back and blow us up on a bus. Well, but you were saying it's because they were taking arms against our allies, arms against the West. Uh, this is not as simple. Interestingly enough, nobody, I don't know about the audience, but certainly in the panel has agreed with Rory Stewart they should just be killed. Mm. For the very obvious point, as Camilla made, you don't just kill them, you tend to kill other people with them, like the 12-year-old who may or may not be dead, mm. which is quite an interesting thing for us to think about. 
We actually don't know if an American drone, but still approved by the UK, killed a 12-year-old British citizen. And everybody, the Prime Minister says, oh, well, I can't talk about that. Well, you know, I think we have to talk about that. If you ask in general <laughs> what I think should happen, is British citizens should be brought back, they should be put on trial, and they should go through due process of law, and we should establish that so that we can say, look, we operate under the rule of law in a judicial no. system. We don't just kill people, and we don't really, Jacob, if I may say so, and I'm sure you wouldn't if you're elevated to these positions, have government ministers who block that sort of thing out. The woman there. Yes, you say about <clears throat> allowing them to come back in. You know, they've been out, they've been fighting for ISIS. Where are we going to detain these individuals when they do come back? We've already got a prison system that's already overflowing. We also had our uh, detention centre, which is local to here, closed. So where will we put these people while we wait on trial? Because, again, as the panel was saying, they've got human rights, but they are coming over and back here to come back and possibly blow us up. And the man at the back, let's just hear some more members of the audience. You, sir, with the spectacles, and then you in green. Yes. man at the very back there. We're hearing about this in the future tense, but my understanding is a lot of these people are already back. So uh, wh where are they? OK. And you in green? Yeah. Um, I don't understand why people are making excuses for them. They've joined a death cult against us. You've seen the videos, or well, you hopefully you haven't seen the videos, when they slaughtered and beheaded journalists. They've supported that, so why would you want people supporting that group back in the country. So what would you... <laughs> what would you... What would you do? What would I do? Um, yeah, just not let them back in. They're not coming back. You've, you've made your decision. OK. Are they not dangerous wherever they are? Yeah, but would you, would you, do you want... Not to us. Do you want, do you want the danger here? They are to us. Do you want them far away from us, which majority will? Why would you want them back when you've seen the atrocities that have been caused by these people because the world is tiny and we have to take our responsibility so for for our citizens however wicked they have been in the world so briefly jacob <laughs> just, the last one. just two, two thoughts one is that if we lower ourselves to the level of isis we destroy our own values more effectively they can do it to us and the the second is that we actively want to get them back and lock them up. I, I agree with Baroness Chakrabarti that we need to have them in British prisons so they are out of the ability to commit any harm uh, on the rest of us. The, the the, uh, well, they, they, they are at our expense because they're British to start with and therefore to some extent it is our responsibility. But our country will be safer if these people are in prison. And I want to see them locked up for the crimes that they have committed. What about right. the people who've come, yes, you. What about the people who've come, you, that's come back to this country and have been lost in the system and re-offended? Mm. Okay. The audience uh, makes a good point as well about radicalisation in prisons yes. and the danger that that poses. Right. Yep. <laughs> Our current detention system has been largely, you know, criticised for causing minor offenders to be, you know, put into more serious situations with crime. Isn't that risk going to get higher if they are mingling with people who are possibly trained ISIS fighters? We don't know. We haven't seen what's happened over there. Um, you know, religiously radical. We, we don't know what they're saying in the prisons. They could be radicalising even more people who already have... Criminal backgrounds. All right. Yeah. Well, well done. Just, have, you, have you had words with your Foreign Office Minister about what he said about killing? And I haven't spoken to him recently, no. What would you say to him if you came across him? Um, well, we might talk about the weather. You never know. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I haven't discussed it with him. I don't share his view. I don't think the right approach is for the British government well, it's not to, break, it's to not break our own law. OK. We'll go on to another question just before we do. Uh, we're going to be in Kilmarnock next Thursday and Croydon the week after that. On the screen you can see the details of how to come and be in the audience. But I want to go on to a question from Sheena Brown, please. Sheena Brown. Should Mark Carney and the BBC admit Brexit will happen and get behind Britain instead of deprecating our nation and continually weakening our bargaining stance? Yeah. Yeah.
Well, that admonition, of course, um, comes from something that Jacob Rees-Mogg himself said this week when he called Mark Carney one of the enemies of Brexit. He's opposed it consistently and called the BBC the Brexit bashing corporation. Um, <laughs> Alex Salmond, is that how you see things? No, uh, I, I, don't, I disagree with the, the question of the, the Lady V. Uh, what weakened Britain's negotiating stance was to invoke Article 50 and go into a time-limited negotiation where we couldn't afford to have no deal. And as soon as we did that, we placed every single card in the hand of the other 27 European Union countries, represented by Monsieur Barnier. And I don't think, I mean, I think we could have the Angel Gabriel negotiating for us and we wouldn't get a decent deal. Uh, I actually rate David Davis rather highly. I think he's able. Uh, but his <laughs> disagreement with the Prime Minister this week mm. rather exemplified the problem he's got. On the one hand, he has to say and pretend that no deal is possible eh, or even semi-attractive and therefore, and then he has to say it might go down to the 59th minute and second or the 59th hour or whatever it is. And then he has to say, well, of course, we said there was going to be a vote in the House of Commons before that happened, which technically, of course, then wouldn't be possible. And what it exemplifies is this time-limited negotiation, which we blundered into, without securing a transitional deal at the end of it. Because all of the time, the clock mm. is working for the other 27. That's what's uh, weakened the UK's negotiating position, not anything that uh, the Governor of the Bank of, uh, mm. of England has said. And the BBC? Uh, uh, well, I mean, I, of course, uh, I always defend the BBC. <laughs> I don't, remember, I don't remember that during the uh, Scottish referendum. Well, that's the whole point. Did you, did you defend the BBC then? Let me put I didn't it think this so. way, if I can give you half a compliment. I think the BBC were much less biased during the Brexit referendum than they were during the Scottish referendum. There you go. Um, <laughs> Chakrabarty, you go next. I, I, with, with respect to the question, I do think that on this one, uh, the Bank of England and the, and the BBC are a distraction from the real problem here. They are not responsible for negotiating Brexit. It's the government. And it's the government that is failing in that responsibility. <laughs> Mark Carney, but, but we know that David Dimbleby is all powerful, but he is not negotiating <laughs> Britain's exit from the EU. The government is divided. The government is chaotic. The government has no plan. And we are in jeopardy as a result. Jacob rees uh, Thank you. Well, first of all, why I have criticised the Governor of the Bank of England and continue to do so is that during the Brexit referendum, he made the bank's views of Brexit clear in a way that he never does in a general election. He didn't give his view earlier this year on what Mr Corbyn's economic plans would do to the United Kingdom, but he did express a view on Brexit. That seemed to me to politicise the Bank of England and to besmirch its reputation. We trust the Bank of England to be apolitical, to be independent, not to be the creature of whoever happens to be Chancellor. What was it he said that particularly offended you? I mean, he said... Oh, the, the risk constant, of a leave vote could possibly the, the, include a the, technical recession, the, didn't he, not he, a recession. What's he, he actually he said, said he, that's, that's upset right. you? He, he warned that there would be a technical recession, but that is a recession. A technical on, on recession basis, isn't a recession, is it, actually? Well, it's a, a technical recession. It's a temporary recession, I think, isn't it? All recessions recession. have so far been temporary in the whole well, history. Well, uh, it depends so, on the time scale. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, a technical... A technical recession is two quarters of GDP declining. Um, he said that. He was completely wrong. The Treasury was worse. It said there would be between 500,000 and 800,000 jobs lost purely on a vote to leave, not actually anything happening. Mm. And just the BBC? On the vote. Dear old auntie. Um, the, 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 the BBC, how many times have we heard in spite of Brexit? In spite of Brexit, a record three million jobs have been created since 2010. In spite of Brexit, unemployment is its lowest level since 1975. Kind of In spite of Brexit, England defeated the West Indies at Lords. I mean, it is... <laughs> it, it, it is again and again... And have you... The, the, I'm sorry, can, well, you actually, can you actually specify well, an occasion when you've well, heard that? You say that, but have you actually... Well, I, can you pin... Have you got a quotation? I've, I've got some other quotations. Now, have you got a quotation saying in but spite we, of Brexit? Well, you just have to listen to the news. Well, and that, that's a generalisation. Have you well, got a specific... No, I think anyone who's listened to the news real, recently has heard the in spite of Brexit uh, terminology. Are and I think sure? the audience... Are knows that. Well, uh, yes, the audience seems to agree. 
But the, the sun... No, they're uh, shaking their heads there. Side you show. found one. The, 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 the sun... <laughs> the sun carried out a survey oh. of the Andrew oh. Marr Show. <laughs> Debates all that. Yeah. But this is quite important, because the Andrew Marr Show has had 84% of its people on being anti-Brexit. 129 um, interviewer ease against 33 in favour, that the balance of the BBC has been against. And actually, I, I disagree with one bit that um, Alex Salmon said. I think during the referendum campaign, the BBC behaved very well and tried extremely hard to be independent. It got such a shock when we voted to leave that since then I think it has behaved uh, very badly. Um, and I think that the situation we're in in terms of the negotiations is exactly what you would expect. We have the two-year time limit. If we hadn't exercised Article 50, the vote would simply not have been implemented. The Thank government you. had to exercise Article 50, and it's now getting on with it. And, of course, it's an argument. That's the, the nature of the negotiation. Right. The, the person there on the left, and then I'll come <coughs> up there, and then I'll come to you, Jermaine. Yes. You say about um, the Bank of England, Mark Carney, getting involved and how he shouldn't be involved, but actually he wouldn't get involved in a general election because if we're not happy with the government, five years from now we can vote them out. With Brexit, this is an entire lifetime. It's going to take a lifetime to fix this situation, however it goes. It seems to me okay. it makes it even more important that he should have been and, impartial. And the man up there? Yeah, um, with respect, I think the BBC have been biased against Brexit. Um, I think that uh, during the referendum campaign, what you often did was you got someone very intelligent to speak on behalf of Remain and uh, you managed to get someone less intelligent to speak on behalf of me. <laughs> I, I personally believe that was... No, no, not you, Jacob. You're a as well. I mean... Jim Angria. Well, it's a funny old world, as Mrs Thatcher said. I mean, uh, we don't really like bankers very much. They seem to have got us into a terrible mess. <coughs> and then by way of getting us out of it, they got us to pay for it. And it's going on like this. We don't seem to have enough money to do anything. But the crowning glory comes when we can't find a citizen to run the bloody Bank of England. We had to go to Canada. <laughs> now, why did we do that? Why didn't you get the job? Uh, well, as the gentleman at the back said, I'm not intelligent enough. So. <laughs> <laughs> I said you are intelligent. Um, on Mark Carney, I think the main criticism is um, he got his economic forecasting on Brexit wrong. He talked about a recession, regardless of whether it was technical or actual. And in fact, there's been five consecutive periods of growth. I think growth is up 1.9%, which was not what the Project Fear Brigade were predicting. Um, on Brexit in general, BBC bias, I think there's, what, two Brexiters on this panel and three Remainers. Um, uh, I don't know whether you've had uh, a panel that's been majority Brexiter, have you, David? Probably. I've heard about the average yeah. intelligence. This is um, average yeah. intelligence yeah. I can't comment on at all, being a lowly <laughs> journalist rather than a um, lofty <coughs> politician. Um, but I would suggest that actually when we speak to our readers on both sides of the demographic divide, mostly people just say, will you get on with it? Just get on with Brexit. Stop posturing. Stop fighting between yourselves. And, you know, the notion of it being a minority as well. Overwhelmingly in Parliament, people voted to have the referendum in the first place. Overwhelmingly in Parliament, people voted to trigger Article 50. Overwhelmingly. 80% or more of the electorate voted for parties that supported Brexit. So just do it. So that's the government that has to just do it, not yeah. Mark Carney and not the BBC. Well, it's not just the government, is it, Shami? It's also the EU, who, oh. despite this conciliatory offer from the foreign <laughs> speech, are digging in their heels, even though a deal for them is mutually beneficial. <laughs> this is what's lost in a lot of the rhetoric. Did the German car industry seriously want to shoot themselves in the o their own feet by not having a free trade agreement with the UK? That would cost the German car industry alone 29,000 jobs. Mm. Right? The trouble is, the Remain argument, I'm afraid, it fails because everybody knows deep down that if we do, if we do get this cake and eat it scenario, we can have free trade with Europe mm. and we can have free trade with the rest of the world. What? That is infinitely All better. Right. What? But it's the it's your chance with the Exchequer, isn't it, who says a cloud of uncertainty over current negotiations acts as a dampener on the economy. This is such an opportunity. When we leave, we can set our own tariffs. 
Tariffs set at the European level make food, clothing and footwear more expensive. They are the highest proportion of the poorest in society's expenditure. If we can get rid of those tariffs, mm -hmm. we help the worst off in society. That is a real benefit. So why and does you know, the Chancellor of the Exchequer not because accept all this the and Treasury, sound so gloomy? Because all the Treasury forecasts assume that instead of cutting tariffs on the rest of the world, we raise tariffs against the EU. That is completely insane. Okay. The Treasury's forecasts are even worse than the Bank of England. <laughs> 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 Yes, sir. Can I just say to Mr. <coughs> Salmon, you're being deliberately disingenuous. You say we should have gone to the EU and sorted something out before we activate an Article 50. You know as well as I do that we weren't in a position to negotiate until Article 50 no. was activated. No, the, uh, I, yes. I, I think at that stage, this is earlier this year, the EU were desperate to have Article 50 invoked. Yes. Uh, there's no reason for the government to do it. The government should not have invoked Article 50 until the transitional period was agreed. But we couldn't uh, do anything with but Europe no, but until we had to Article 50. Look, it's, it's like uh, who blinks first. And unfortunately, it was the UK government that decided because to blink. Why to, did they do it? All right, they didn't have to invoke Article 50. I voted right, to, to, to trigger Article 50. I voted to trigger Article 50. against the invoking precisely for that reason. Let's not go back over that ground. Let's go to another, another subject from Alice Moore. Your question, please, Alice Moore. Who should be held accountable for low and decreasing numbers of poor and non-white students at Oxford and Cambridge? Who should be held responsible for the, well, we got the figures the other day, the decreasing numbers of poor and non-white students at Oxford and Cambridge? Jermaine yeah. Greer. This is a really difficult question. I mean, the, the very suggestion that we've had to heed that we could lower the points required at A-level in order to allow poorer students to <coughs> attend the elite universities is insulting to them, apart from anything else. Um, that is not the problem there. Part of the problem is that these universities are not actually particularly merciful to people who come from a different social class to the middle class that they are I at ease with. I mean, we've all heard the stories of the girl who came to Newnham who uh, didn't know how to sit in the bath. She sat with her back at the tap end and everybody sneered at her because she didn't have a bath at home. Um, they didn't go skiing on their holidays. She had never been abroad and all that sort of thing. They're very snobbish places. But you can still crack it. I mean, you can, what our real problem here, I think, is that we don't have enough scholarships. From, for the last 40 years, when I was still a fellow at Newnham, I was saying there's only one way we'll get the right students. We have to do what we have to do with everything else. We have to buy them. And we have to give them a deal that is wonderful, where their fees are <coughs> paid, they're well housed, they have travel allowances, they have books, and we actually get the best out of them. Instead, they struggle. They struggle against trying to read the encoded social language of the institution. And the institution is probably not the thing you think it is. You know, it, we, Cambridge is what now? The second research university in the world? But that doesn't reflect the undergraduate body at all. And it certainly doesn't reflect the teaching. And one of the things that drives me crazy is when you go to university, you don't get taught by the people you've heard about who teach at that university. You get taught by a graduate student. Mm. This is not the deal. This is not... This doesn't justify the enormous amount of money that we have to spend on the Russell Group. There's one other thing. Is, is, uh, is it the case that some secondary, state secondary schools are pessimistic about getting their pupils into the Russell Group universities, Oxford and Cambridge, and don't actually push them, don't actually offer them that as an opportunity, but say that's not for you, for the reasons you've been describing? Look, that may be the case, but I think they're also quite likely to know uh, that the students in question would be happier somewhere else. There are other universities that are more encouraging. Uh, Cambridge can be profoundly dismissive. If you haven't read the right books, if your family doesn't have books in the house and so forth, you can gradually feel that you are permanently disadvantaged. And that's still true now, is it still true now? Well, I haven't taught at Cambridge for a while and I didn't teach that way when I did. But I was pretty well aware of it. Um, what it's, okay. What's happening now, I think, if we did have a healthy scholarship system where students could actually correctly choose their university. Now, they're not all going to be happy doing the tripos. And the tripos's usefulness is, could be challenged. There are other things that might be much more okay. Camilla, worthy. Camilla Tomlin, um, thank you very much. 
I think as well the problem starts at primary and secondary education because we are in a two-tier system. We don't have grammar schools anymore, but we have selective schools where really you can only get your children in if you tutor them, and that costs money. And that then means that poorer families who have got bright kids can't get them in because they haven't had somebody who they're paying every Sunday morning to teach their children verbal and non-verbal reasoning. Whether that's a skill that judges children on their academic ability or not is up to teachers to decide. I equally think as well when it comes to bursaries that um, a lot of poorer families just don't think that's for them. Interestingly, now that the grammar schools revolution has been put on the back burner, free schools are having a lot of success in deprived areas. Uh, during the Tory party conference, I spoke to Toby Young, who's obviously been heavily involved in that movement. And at the school in Newham, which was started seven years ago, so it's now coming to fruition and some of these children are making university applications, 15 of these kids have got into Oxbridge. Now, that would have been unthinkable with the previous system and without this free school. So clearly needs, more needs to be done. You sat there. <coughs> oh, I disagree that it's the um, secondary school because I went to a state secondary school and they, if anything, encouraged you to apply to uh, go to the higher universities. They pushed you towards that. And I managed to get good results at my GCSEs and that's not putting me off trying to apply to Oxford or Cambridge. And you're doing that now, are you? I will next year be next applying year. to those universities. Uh, Alex Salmond. Well, let's uh, wish the young lady every success, but I think the responsibility does lie with Oxbridge. Uh, the, if you have it just on qualifications, most state school pupils will be at a disadvantage compared to most private school pupils. Because public schools in England will teach not just for the exams, but they'll teach for the entrance requirements. And therefore, if it's only grade against grade, you'll get the situation of a, a substantial social disparity. There's also a responsibility for the government. I mean, fees, which are totally, utterly outrageous in England, uh, are a bigger disincentive for lower income families than they are for higher income families, obviously. Being, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 pounds of debt is a big disincentive, and you should do something about English politicians who try to retain such an unequal system. But lastly, because we've still got a problem in Scotland with some of our, you know, like St Andrews, for example, not, not on a racial basis, but on a working, you know, a working class basis. And I've come to the conclusion that the only way you can actually tackle this and do it so that people don't say, oh, well, I had so many A's and I didn't get in when somebody else got in with lower grades, is to have a a system of certain amount of entries out with the examination system. I think people should qualify through the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme or through voluntary work or something like that. They should be taken to these universities for a summer school over a period of perhaps six weeks, uh, assessed over that school, and that could be a form of entry along with the scholarship system that Germain uh, Jermaine, so, and the reason that I think is I, w I hope that uh, such a system might be introduced in Scotland and I would commend such a system for Oxbridge to try and have the social diversity that this nation of England should demand okay. from its top uh, universities. Uh, Alice Moore, what do you, what do you think? Um, as a former teacher, I agree with the young lady up there, it's not about poverty of aspiration at schools at all. Um, we encourage our students to aim as high as they can. I think what Jermaine says a kind of, um, you know, the social playing field, it's, it's completely uneven. You know, if you, see, if you don't see anyone around you, if you don't have anyone in your family that's been to these kind of places, it's just such an unfamiliar, you know, the, the cultural expectations are so unfamiliar to you. I think that is off-putting. So, so it, what do you think should be done? That's not my job to decide. Shema Shakrabarti, what do you think should be done? I think that there is a, a greater responsibility on these so-called elite universities to demonstrate that they are for, for everyone and that they need to, they need to take more positive steps of the, of the sorts of things you've been mooting. But they should be actively recruiting. They should be actively sending staff and, head, and recruiters and people to go and speak in state schools in poorer parts of the country to to try and bust this idea that you're not you're not welcome here but i do think that the government has a responsibility too i went to the london school of economics in the late 80s and did a law degree without which i wouldn't be here tonight my parents did not have any money but i had a full maintenance grant and zero tuition fees mm. that made the world of difference to me and my life chances now would i do that would i take on the kind of debt that would be required for me to have that same education today, knowing that my parents couldn't afford to help. I don't, I'm not convinced, that, I'm not convinced that I would. 
So I think government has a responsibility and these so-called elite universities have a massive responsibility right. and ethical duty as well. Yes, the, the woman there in the fourth row. Yeah. One, two, three, four from the front, yes. I think that equality is such a complex issue. And I think one of the main things we need to focus on is whether we're um, talking about equality of outcome or equality of opportunity. Because equality of opportunity won't necessarily pr produce equality of outcome. So, for example, if, you have, you, if you're striving for equality of outcome, if you have 50% women, 50% men, but equality of opportunity means that everyone gets the same starting position, but it doesn't mean they all reach the same place. So it's much more complex than saying, oh, we should strive for equality. You need to really think about what equality means. Um, <laughs> yes, but the question was about the numbers going yeah. of poor and, and uh, non-white students. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Well, I actually agree with what the ladies just said. I think that uh, you want to have an equality of opportunity, but that may mean that you need to help people mm. to get that opportunity in the first place. Um, it's worth noting on... Fee on loans, student loans, they have actually led to a very large increase in the number of people going to university from the poorest decile of income. And that's quite interesting because it's not necessarily what you would expect, but it has encouraged the poorest to go to university. I, I very much agree with Jermaine Greer that I think having uh, bursaries and scholarships so that people will really be incentivized to go through uh, university. And I think, dare I say it, that people who have had the good fortune that I've had and go to schools like Eton, where I was with your son, as I think many people know, um, uh, uh, when, when you've had that great advantage, it is not unreasonable for the people examining you when you get to Oxford and Cambridge to recognise that you have had every possible advantage and somebody who hasn't had so many advantages but who may have done less well in the exam may actually be cleverer and more able and I think it's perfectly fair to maintain equality of opportunity by recognising that there have been inequalities in the early but there is a, There is a distinction, isn't there, between the number of people, the percentage of people from the lowest financial decile, economic decile, going to university and the numbers going to Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, that's that, that's the, absolutely true. And, and is it important in your view that uh, the entry to Oxford and Cambridge should be opening up in the same way as all the other universities? Absolutely. It's very important that Oxford and Cambridge uh, maintain their world-beating standard and therefore they should not take quotas but what they should do is make it as easy as possible for clever people from disadvantaged backgrounds to get in and going out to schools, and it's brilliant to hear that schools are encouraging people to apply, because certainly anecdotally one's heard the reverse, and right. that some pupils are told, don't try for Oxford and Cambridge, it won't suit you. And that really shouldn't happen, that should be strongly discouraged, and schools should work with the universities to encourage bright people to go, not just because that's the right thing to do for the individuals, but it's also very good for the country, that if our brightest people get the best education, that is going to be very good uh, for the country over the next generation. Be able to have a UK uh, Bank of England um, bloke Lovely. to run the bank. Yeah, you, m m uh, yes. <laughs> muttering to myself. You in black and in the black dress. There. Yes, you on the bank on the gangway. Uh, uh, the woman uh, on the gangway. Come on, there. Thank you. <laughs> but if we only have a small tokenistic amount of places opened up. The culture and the support that's available to them when they arrive at Oxbridge and maybe are mixing with the elitists from the public schools, it gives that impression of them feeling different and as if they're being a worthy cause. We need to really challenge the culture and the support in these universities that make it an accepting and welcoming place for a more diverse range of students okay. to go. And, and the woman behind you in the row behind there? Yes? I'd like to suggest a civilian form of national service for 18-year-olds. Um, about a third of the time, the work that they would do would be some form of education. Uh, they would also do work and sport. And the people in charge of national service would be able to assess. I loved what Alex suggested about um, other routes beside educational qualifications. That would assess character, leadership, and it would also have people of different classes mixing together. So a compulsory national service before that. Yes. And then can you go along the row to the second person from the end there? You, yes. 
Um, I think we need to stop skirting around the issue, really. If you're a child and you're in a class of 34 students, mm. your TA is no longer there because of the budget cuts, mm. how yeah. are you going to have the same opportunities, the same quality Absolutely. of teaching as those in private schools in a class of 10? Okay. <laughs> yes, we're in here. Actually, I think that already Oxford is doing a lot of the things that Alex Salmon mentioned. There is such a thing called contextual admissions where things are taken into account, such as the sort of school one went to and therefore how likely it is that one would have got good A-levels. And also I feel, and I, I work here at the University of Portsmouth, that it is a case that students should be choosing the university that gives them the education that they need. And here, a lot of that is applied real-life professional practice. Okay, and last word from you. Uh, yes, I, I, agree with, I agree with the uh, questioner that it's a societal problem rather than an elitist problem. Um, my father was actually uh, the admissions tutor at, uh, Oxford, at St Peter's College, Oxford, when he retired. And, um, and the bane of his life was quotas for different ethnic minority uh, students. Um, he frequently told me that um, he had to choose less uh, academically able students just because of the places and the uh, backgrounds that they come from. And, and at the end of the day, Oxford and Cambridge are centres of academic excellence and that should be championed above... above yeah. uh, well, can, can, I, can I give you a case uh, study? Glasgow University and St Andrews University I have an interest in both. I'm a doctor of Glasgow University. I was a student at St Andrews. Now, they're both highly rated, internationally orientated universities. But Glasgow has a huge social mix in its student population. St Andrews doesn't. <laughs> uh, and I think the, the idea that you maintain excellence by having a fairly exclusive social mix Absolutely. is entirely wrong-headed, uh, is entirely mistaken. And I think the, these two examples of two outstanding universities but one of which mm. I think fulfills its duty to the population as a whole by educating people across the, the social spectrum. Quite. And the other, I'm afraid, does not. Well, right. Quite. Uh, OK. Yeah. Very briefly, very briefly. I disagree in, entirely with that. Um, <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day, uh, Glasgow isn't as a sought-after place as St Andrews. Oh. And oh. Oh, all right, well... <laughs> and, I wouldn't go down that road with him yet. <laughs> Well, uh, no, OK, I think we we'll lose. Thank you for the point, though, but we'll, we'll, we'll be in Scotland next week and discuss it. Yes, yes, yes. very, very brief. J I'd just very like to make would. one simple point. I, I have taught all my life, mm. and I've taught people who came from the same sort of background that I did, for whom, for example, uh, Cambridge was a terrible environment. They were absolutely miserable. The last thing you'd want to do is waste those precious three years of a young person's life by having them being miserable at a place like Cambridge. And what used to happen is that they would identify with the town kids, they would hang out with the bikies, they would get into trouble, um, and the wastage amongst that particular precious group of students was very high. Now, we shouldn't be uh, supposing we can drop them into that rather complicated social situation and they will have the skills to avoid damage uh, because I think the damage in at least two cases that I know of, both brilliant young women, they abandoned their education altogether and I can't tell you what became of them. All right, thank you. Paul Pritchard, let's have a last question from you. Should congestion charging be introduced in all cities to improve air quality? Should, well, London has now introduced a congestion charge of £10 for old vehicles, old diesel vehicles and all that, and Oxford is suggesting um, clearing its centre for, uh, for, for cars completely and just having electric cars. Should congestion charging... This is our, our um, question about the environment, which we're duty-bound to do. Um, Camilla Tomney, what do you think? Well, I drive a diesel, so I'm no. now persona non grata um, in the environmental <coughs> world. Having been encouraged to buy a diesel, of course, because I was told yeah. that it was more fuel efficient and that it was better for the environment until all of that scientific evidence that was presented by Labour was roundly debunked. And so now I'm saddled with a diesel, which I don't have to pay the T charge for because it's a post-2006 car. I don't want to scrap it because it's a good car and I think that would be added wastage. 
I am interested in buying a hybrid or an electric car and I want to see the technology come on, but they are very expensive and I'm not really in the market to replace uh, and my personal car. And what's your answer to the question? We, your personal history well, is fascinating, but what is the answer? Thank you, Dave. <laughs> what is the answer to the question of whether... We do have to take a personal issue on some of these questions because as a diesel driver it does make a difference. My answer to the question is this, if transport links are good enough, there should be no reason why we need as ordinary citizens right. to drive into cities. However, <coughs> if you're a white van man or a courier or a delivery driver, I don't see why you should be penalised for doing your job in a town okay. centre. <laughs> and we, only have, we only have two or three minutes left. Jacob Rees-Mogg. Okay, in London... The congestion's worse, even though there are fewer cars on the road, and that's because they've narrowed half the road, so you can't get anywhere. I don't believe that government should make people's lives more difficult, and diesel is one of the real scandals of government policy of the last 20 years. As Camilla was saying, people were encouraged to buy diesels because of worries about carbon dioxide, ignoring the nitrous oxides and the particulates from diesel, which have killed people, have meant people have died younger than they should have done. This is a real scandal of public policy. And no, I don't think the answer is penalising the motorist. Most of us actually want to drive into cities, particularly if you represent a rural constituency like mine, people who want to go into Bath or Bristol, they want to drive in. It would take them all week to get a bus. They'd have to <laughs> dev devote their whole life to plotting the bus route. <laughs> they want to drive in and out, and I think politics is about making life easier for people, allowing them to do what they want to do, and taking obstacles out of their way, not ordering them about, about how they should live their lives, so definitely not. Shami Chakrabarti. <coughs> congestion charges in all cities to improve the I think there quality. is a role for congestion charging, but, but only if it's matched with cheap, accessible public transport. Yeah. Right? <laughs> And we do not, we do not have that in large parts of this country. And so the is... mayor of London was wrong to introduce this new extra charge. No, no, not at all. Do you think I, there I, is no, I think, adequate? I, I think there's a role for there's a role for congestion charging, but there is, but you can't. The double whammy is if it costs t too much to drive and you have no access to affordable right. public transport. I'm told transport. we only have a minute left. Alex Salmond. Well, I, I was listening to, to Jacob and I was thinking that this this is a man who once campaigned in a Bentley in central Fife. Uh, luckily, there was no congesting charges at the time, uh, Jacob, so you got off of it. Uh, I, 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 I agree. Congestion charges are fine if there are options, either proper public transport or the move to, to electric. A hundred years ago, Andrew Carnegie was running electric taxis in Skibo Castle in the north of Scotland, and I think that technology didn't come on because the internal combustion engine ruled and we should go whole scale, full tilt for it now and give people that right. cheap option that even Camilla uh, will be able to afford. Okay. I said we only had a minute and I meant it. Jermaine Greer, you have about half a minute as a result of that. Look, Alex. taking money off people makes no difference to air quality whatsoever. There's no connection between the two okay. ideas. Thank you, Jermaine. And thank you for the brevity. I was hoping you might take the question which you will understand about how you felt about recovering from an operation in the home of a stranger, <laughs> which was this proposal for oh, £50. That, pound, course, yeah, yeah, Airbnb, but we can't no, get to it because our time's up. Shame.